Okay. Got it plugged in. I think that's about the right spot. Is it coming through? Okay. Uh, the background noise of the ice machine is just enough, and my hearing has declined just enough that I can't even tell if I'm coming through the speakers or not. I just relax. <laughs> Glad you're back, Roger. <laughs> but I am. <laughs> I just automatically, he takes advantage of me because he knows I will take seriously and literally anything that someone says to me and just take advantage of that. That's but on a serious note, the, volume is high. the volume is not high. What? Okay. Well, good morning. I'm glad to glad to be here. Glad to see uh, glad to see people back who were traveling last week, and uh, always glad to have guests. But especially if they're relatives, relatives and family of Vicky um, and Roger. They're actually yours. Well, okay, by by marriage, and I. I no, but no, we, we love and treasure them. So glad when they came our way. And um, wish you all safe travels back. Uh, wish you all safe travels back home. Glad you're here. Let's pray before we get started. God, thank you for the beautiful day you've blessed us with. Thank you for us being able to come together to study your word. Father, please forgive our sins. Please forgive us when we step out of that path that you've appointed for us. Please forgive us when we get distracted and don't keep our eyes on the things that we should. Father, we thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. We need it every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we had gotten into the uh, parable of the sower last week, and this group of parables, just for, for context, we're looking at parallel passages between the, uh, the synoptic gospels, between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in this section of, um, after, the, you know, after the introductory period of Jesus' ministry, when he started to become known, then in this section of the gospels, we start to see him getting some pushback from the religious authorities, from people that his teaching offended or threatened. And looking at the things that Jesus taught in response to that, and some of these parables that are in all three of those gospels fit into that, uh, fit into that narrative as well in certain ways. Um, looking at the, this is such a, a familiar story, and just from a from a teaching standpoint, um, this has got to be one of the greatest illustrations of all time, right? <laughs> the parable of the sower. Anyone who's ever tried to grow anything anywhere around the world understands the difficulties involved here, even if it's if it's just house plants. And Laura, I don't know how much you were. Sorry, put you on the spot. I don't remember how much you were involved in the garden project in Tulsa. That was kind of dad did that to keep me out of the house and <laughs> out of trouble. <laughs> but after we moved to Tulsa, we, um, uh, my dad planted a, a garden. We ended up taking up over half the backyard in that garden. And uh, it was, uh, it was worthwhile for a little kid to be involved in because I've actually plowed a furrow <laughs> with a hand plow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the big wheel in front and the plow blade. And, uh, we did not use any kind of, we did not use any kind of power equipment to do this gardening. This was all, you're going to break the ground up, you're going to shovel it. <laughs> that kept me occupied for a long time. <laughs> I said, okay, go break up that ground. <laughs> And, of course, digging up the dirt, that's always fun. But uh, I'm thankful for that, really. Over the years, I've been very thankful for that because uh, 
there are a lot of things in this parable that, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> know exactly what that's talking about. And I'll have a little more to say about that a little bit later. The sower goes out to sow, and there are different things that happen to the seed. The seed falls some on the wayside, on the, on the path, and the birds come and, and devoured them. If <laughs> you've seen birds devouring things before, when I mow the yard, I have uh, sometimes, well, not this time of year, but in the spring, I'll have a couple of robins will usually just follow me around after I'm mowing, and they're just grabbing every little bug that jumps up there. They're, they're uh, working to devour that. And the seed that falls on the rocky ground, it doesn't have much soil. Um, Luke says it fell on the rock. Uh, Matthew and Mark explain uh, a little more detail. It fell on ground that was rocky where there's not much soil. It grows up, and Matthew and Mark mention that it grows up immediately. It grows up very quickly, but because it has no depth of soil, then it is scorched by the sun and withers away. Uh, Luke, with the clarifying statement from Luke, because it had no moisture. It's just slightly, slightly different versions of what, of what Jesus said, or perhaps he told this parable more than once, and it's, have you ever heard a preacher tell the same illustration or story more than once? It tends to happen. <laughs> yeah, they get favorites, you know. You can imagine Jesus traveling as he was. Of course, he's going to use the same things at different times. So sometimes when one gospel has this version and another gospel has the Sounds like the same story, but a little bit different wording. Maybe that's different times. Maybe that's just different occasions. And the seed that falls among the thorns, the thorns grow up and choke it. And it yields no grain. It does grow, but it doesn't yield any grain. And then, of course, some falls on the good soil, and it produces, and some is... 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And then these statements at the end, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Interesting statement there. And then, of course, Jesus gives the explanation of it. One who hears the word and does not understand it is that one that's the, that's the wayside. And Satan comes and snatches away the word. What's on the rocky ground is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Kind of an interesting thing there, that they receive it with joy, but then it, he endures for a while, but then he falls away because of persecution or tribulation. Sowing among thorns, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches Luke has the very colorful phrase, it's choked by these things. And it doesn't, it proves unfruitful. And then what's sown on the good soil is the one who hears the word and understands it and bears fruit and yields. And uh, Mark's account says they, uh, they hear the word and accept it. Not only understand, but they understand it in the sense of also accepting that this is what I have to do, this is how I have to live my life. And they have this growth. That wasn't all that long ago, <laughs> 1930s, and a man in Palestine sowing seed by the, same, by the same method. Has anyone ever sown seed like that by the broadcast method? Just take handfuls of seed and, and throw it out there, I think. Uh, I think uh, greens of different kinds uh, planted that way. Um, mustard. mustard greens. Yeah, mustard greens, things like that. Just, just throw seeds out there instead of... <laughs> fire ant poison. Fire ant poison. Get this metaphor off track here if we go into that. <laughs> but yeah, same old method. Same old thing people have been doing for, I guess, as long as people have been planting. Some things like that, it works just as well to, to plant it that way. So looking at... Uh, Looking at this, at this parable, Jesus doesn't, in his explanation, he doesn't really say who the sower is. In some ways, 
the Jesus himself is an illustration of the sower. He could have been talking about himself and his own ministry because he, didn't he have all those same reactions from people? There were, there were all the same things. There were people who just they had no interest in what he was saying. There were people who were sort of interested. We think of the rich young ruler being like the one with the thorns. He, he was certainly interested. He was honestly interested, but there were other things that just, that just uh, turned him away. And his followers are sowers too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 is where Paul says, uh, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Think about the humility of that statement, because who did more than Paul to spread the gospel? That man gave himself to that work. And there was a man of a lot of ability and skills and you know, had, had just every kind of thing. He, he's the one out of the apostles that from a worldly standpoint, you'd look at Paul's resume and say, that looks like somebody you'd want because of his education and his personality and abilities. But Paul says, I planted. Apollos watered. Now here's Apollos is a was known for, what was Apollos known for? It's an oratory, yeah. He was, he was considered a great speaker. And he was also, the most impressive thing to me about Apollos is as great a speaker as he was, and as good as he was at holding a crowd's attention apparently and uh, being recognized for that, he had the humility when um, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. He had the humility to listen to that, and he, he accepts that and changes. So many people wouldn't be willing to do that. And uh, so here you have Paul planting Apollos watering, and God gives the increase. It's all about God giving the increase. So the sower is not really so, so important. We can be sowers too. And, you know, certainly not any comparison to the ministry of Jesus. And very few people that I could name that I would uh, even uh, begin to put in the category of Paul or Apollos. But we have the same seed that they did. And that's where the important, that's where the important thing is anyway. What's the seed then? Jesus says it's the word of God. And some things about that that... Uh, come to mind, or the seed reproducing according to its kind, that principle back in Genesis chapter 1, that there, was, uh, there were plants that had, there are some plants that don't have seeds, right, of course, some kinds of things, but the seed, the plants that have seed reproduce according to their kind. You're going to get what you plant. The information, we understand a lot more about that now, from a scientific standpoint, we understand more about it than people did back in ancient times. It's the same principle. The, the seed reproduces according to its kind because it has DNA, has things that, uh, you know, that are encoded into that genetic material that determine what it's going to do. And we understand that to the extent that you're able to uh, cross two kinds of plants and determine certain characteristics and get a little bit Better kind, of, uh, better kind of fruit for some region or other, or something that's a little more hardy. That seed reproduces according to its kind. The Word of God is the same kind of thing. Uh, Peter talks about it as the, the imperishable seed. In First Peter, I cannot remember the wording of that exactly right. In 1 Peter 1.23, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So that's an imperishable seed. We don't ever really see something like that in the natural world. I think I mentioned right at the end of class last time that there's the uh, Judean date palm. It used to be really common across, uh, uh, across uh, Palestine and the the near, the near East, and went extinct sometime during the Middle Ages. 
Well, they found some Judean date palm seeds. Now, there's other kinds of date palms, obviously, but this, this specific type that was really common in that area, and it died out. They found some seeds in a, in a clay jar in the ruins of Herod's palace when that was being excavated. I think it's out by Jericho, big palace complex out in that part of the country, and found this jar with date palm seeds that were that old type of Judean date palm. Well, they took some of those and soaked them in miracle Grow or whatever, <laughs> you know, to try to give them nutrients. Of course, in that dry climate, they had just, they'd not been spoiled. And they actually got one to grow after all these centuries. They actually got one to grow. Then it turned out to be a male tree, so it can't, can't grow anymore. <laughs> but they think they're going to try to take, uh, take that one and uh, another kind of close relative and maybe uh, get a hybrid that's similar to it just to see what that's like. But we, we see examples sometimes where a, a seed can survive many centuries. And that is even more the case with the Word of God, isn't it? The seed is not the problem. That's reassuring, I think, for us in our situation in history here because the seed that was planted by Jesus, by the apostles, bore fruit, but then a lot of things went wrong in the church, didn't they? Over the centuries, a lot of things went wrong. The church got to a place where it was divided and had uh, changed so much that we don't really even know when. At some point, don't even really think of it as the church anymore. It becomes the Roman Catholic Church. It becomes the Greek Orthodox Church and the other uh, branches there. Then the Reformation starts, and there's a lot of good intentions there, but that ends up... You know, the great tragedy with Martin Luther, he specifically said, whatever you do, don't name the church after me. What they do? They call it the Lutheran Church. People, people do that. Um, the principle of restoration, the idea that you can get back to the original, seemed so far, so far fetched after all these centuries. But the seed is still there. The seed is still the same thing. The power is in the seed, not in the people, and not, it's not all the intervening centuries that have gone in between that matter. The seed will still bear fruit, just like that date palm, but more so because we're talking about the power of God. So it's not the seed that's the problem, but get back to the, to the point of the parable is how is that seed received, and then what happens after that seed is planted and uh, begins to grow to a plant that bears fruit. Well, the wayside, Jesus tells, it, tells us this is the person who doesn't understand. I am... The discussion in 1 Corinthians 2 about the, uh, the natural man and the spiritual man is a, is a kind of complicated passage, but I would just suggest anyway that uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 is a good description of what Jesus is talking about of the, the soil on the wayside. 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says the natural man, the natural person, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things. So the person who is the natural person, as Paul says it, we might substitute worldly, <laughs> a worldly person, an unspiritual person, a person who's not thinking about spiritual things. The seed, the message doesn't make sense to them. And it, it just, you know, it's just in one ear and out the other, if it even gets that far. And we also find out from Jesus that Satan works actively to get that seed out. We have opposition here. There's an interesting little picture here from Egypt just a couple of years ago. And you can't really see this man's expression, but he, he just has a sort of expression like of resignation. <laughs> that, yeah, these birds are following me and they're just gobbling up that seed as fast as they can go. He's, he can throw out more seed than they can eat and eventually they'll get full. But 
you can imagine the birds just think, this guy is great. He's just throwing food out for us. That's, that's what they're going to do. They're just snatching that up. Well, that seed didn't even get hardly in contact with the ground before. And you may have dogs or cats that are the same way about food or something never, you know, never even hits the floor. And that dog will be on it and, and get after it. The, the wayside doesn't really have much of a chance. That's where the, the ground is hard, the seed can't get in, and it's just easy prey. Satan does certain things to try to get it away from us, keep it from sinking in. Who knows what methods exactly. Maybe it's just as simple as something like, ooh, something bright and shiny. <laughs> just get your attention diverted away from that spiritual message. Devious, hateful, but that yeah, that's that's Satan. <laughs> and the more devious and hateful he can be, the more he likes it. <laughs> so one of the points that he makes is what determines the destiny. Three out of the four had soil. Right? He said, "What determines our destiny, our final destiny, is is how we uh, our attitude towards God's word." Mm -hmm. Right. In his power to snatch using those. those yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good point. You know, something bad happens. How many people do we know that when something, you know, a car wreck, the evilness of alcohol, a guy mm -hmm. drinks, and bam, he runs in there. Yeah. Someone falls away because three of their kids were killed in that car. Yeah. They, all-loving God yeah. allow it. So, you know, he'll use things like that and then false religion, you know, just how the devil works out. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good lesson. Yeah, yeah, that's Johnny Ramsey you're talking about there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always glad to hear points that he had about things. He's very succinct and to the point in his teaching. Um, yeah, I think what the I think what in military strategy, I think you call this area denial. Right? You don't ever want to even let them get close to uh, the devil doesn't want you to even get close to the word of God. If he can, that's why um, I think uh, I think uh, I have heard that someone's parents used to tell them that's why the wonderful world of Disney was on Sunday nights because the devil was trying to get you to stay home and watch that. I always hated that because that, they'd have those good movies on on Sunday nights and you couldn't watch it. There was a good Robin Hood series on Wednesday nights and couldn't watch it unless I was sick. But not to be trivial about it, but sure, even something like that, <laughs> even, something, even something very trivial can nudge that person away in that, uh, that moment, that moment's gone there. Uh, those of you who are teachers for a profession in here know how difficult it is. Uh, you're teaching pre-K now. I forget, you go back and forth between pre-K and kindergarten. And yeah, the teachable moment there is more like a teachable nanosecond with that age. <laughs> but adults are not a whole lot better, are they? <laughs> so, if Kathy were here, she could probably tell stories about that with uh, young college students. No offense to present company who are the exception. In the rocky ground, there's no depth of soil, no moisture. By contrast, one of my favorite psalms, the very first one, Psalm 1, 
in verse 3, he talks about the righteous person. He's like a tree. Know this phrase? It's like the tree planted by water. Growing up in the, the northern part of Oklahoma, um, Vicki will understand this, that you know when you see trees that there must be a stream or a ditch nearby because no tree would ever grow out there otherwise. And those are trees that are, they've gotten close to a place where there's water. And those roots go down and grab into that water and they dig down into the dirt. It's kind of a sad example, but it, it illustrates the point. Have you ever seen a really large tree that's been blown over in a storm and actually pulled the root ball up? You may not see that very often. We had a F5 tornado in Nashville, went through East Nashville, old neighborhoods back in uh, the early 2000s. And there were trees that had been pulled up by the roots and it was like half of somebody's yard came up out of the ground with that tree because those big old trees were so dug in. It took something like an F5 tornado to tear them out. Well, that, from a spiritual standpoint, that's that tree planted by the water. There may be dry seasons. There can be dry seasons, and have you ever seen a, during a dry season, everything around it is dying, but that old tree it's going to come through it because it's got its roots way, way down deep. That's what this rocky ground is lacking when those hard times come. It needs those deep roots. Peter tells us uh, about trials. He says, don't be surprised. <laughs> you know? Why are you surprised that you're having trials? <laughs> Peter, could, Peter could relate to that. and He, he makes a good point. Says, don't don't act like some unexpected thing has come upon you here because you're facing tribulation. You can expect that. But you need to be rooted. And there's passages there in Ephesians and Colossians talk about being rooted in love and rooted in faith. An interesting point about this that some commentators drew out, I wish I was smart enough to have seen this on my own, that Jesus describes this person as someone who obeys the word, receives the word with joy. It's not like they were just sort of lukewarm from the beginning. They receive it with joy, and there's this immediate growth at the beginning, but then failure. And does that mean, is there any, does that mean that there's something wrong with joy in receiving the word? Of course not. Does that mean that person's shallow or something? Because you say, well, that person's shallow. They're just all worked up in an excitement. There's, there's, a, there's a valid excitement. There should be to a person who discovers this, this treasure, discovers what God's done for us. But the joy itself isn't enough. There are plenty of examples of, of uh, people who are converted and they have great joy. The Ethiopian goes on his way rejoicing. Wonder what that was, you know, what that was like. He's riding off in his chariot, just just singing and praising God. Who knows? He's he goes on his way rejoicing. They receive it with joy, but they got to follow through. There's another parable of Jesus, uh, Matthew thirteen forty four, about the man who finds a treasure in the field. And here he's he's going across a field, and then he finds a buried treasure. Would you have joy at that? Yeah, he has a lot of joy at that. Like, wow, there's a, <laughs> there's a treasure here I wasn't looking for. But he goes and sells all he has so he can go buy that field. And that's the difference there, that he has joy, but he follows through with the things he needs to do to completely stuck on a word here. He follows through with what he needs to do to make this continue so that this joy can continue to grow. The joy itself is a, is a good thing, but it's not enough. There needs, to be, there needs to be depth to that joy and growth because things are not always going to be happy, right? They're not always going to be happy. You're going to go through different times in your life, and boy, it's a dangerous ground to talk about marriage, but my wife's in the, teaching the one-year-old class. Do you have the same kinds of feelings that you did when you were first married uh, a month, 30 years later. Nobody has to answer that. 
you know, we kind of romantically want to say that, yeah, we've, we're still on our honeymoon. That's, that's right, you're still on your honeymoon. But realistically, you're not the same people that you were then either. And I, the only way I would, could describe it is it's different. It's different, but better. But it's different. It's a brave man. Yeah. 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 True. Very good point. I first met Leah. Parents are sitting right there. <laughs> I first met Leah and, and thought, she's really cute. And she's really smart. And she can sure play the piano. Good musician. All great points in her favor. And, you know, within a week or so, I was just completely smitten and just, just loved all kinds of things about her. But I didn't know her near as well as I do now. I hadn't seen the, I hadn't seen the, the strength. I hadn't seen the endurance. I hadn't seen the, the patience that she's had to have to be married to me for 30 plus years. And in the same way, our spiritual understanding, our, our relationship with God should mature in that way too. That we've been through things together and that makes a difference, right? When we've been through things together. Dean. Yeah, I love people say, you know, we've been married for 40 years, we've never had a cross word. You don't talk to each other. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> we've never really had a fight. We've had a lot of spirited discussions of things, but <laughs> you know how that is. It's true. The thorny ground. Well, it does kind of bear some fruit, but it never, I mean, it, it, it produces a plant, but it doesn't bear the, the fruit that it's supposed to. It gets choked off. There's uh, other things that are competing with that, with that good plant. And there's a couple of types of thorns that are described in the, in the, in the parable, there are the cares. Uh, the Greek word there is the marimna, which literally, somebody tells me, I don't speak Greek, but I have read that that literally means pulled in two different directions. We don't have an English word based off of this. We do have one based off the Latin equivalent. It's called distraction. You have traction, you know, a tractor pulls things, and die is two things. So when you are pulled in two directions, that's distraction, literally, from the roots of the words. That's what distraction's doing to you. It's pulling you in different directions. And so there are things that are pulling away from, from the, where the seed is needing to grow. There's the deceitful riches. How deceitful are riches? Ask the rich fool. Thought he had it all made. He thought he had everything and found out too late he's a fool. Yeah, but you're going to die tonight, and then what do you got? <laughs> what, does that, what good does any of that do you? Because when it comes to that point, we're all going to stand equal. We're all going to take exactly the same amount out of this world that we came into it with. Uh, whether you're, who's the richest person in, in the world right now? I can't remember. Besides, next to Kevin Kogas. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. In our lives, we have a lot of things that are going on that are not necessarily sinful, but they are a distraction mm -hmm. from our purpose. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we can all think back, you know, to we allow things of this world to, to distract us. And yeah. Sometimes we don't choose to do that. Yeah. It's not necessarily not sinful. Yeah. And so Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, if you believe it's Paul, uh, says, hey, you've got to lay those things aside. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. It's a good passage to bring into this. Uh, those weights, if I remember correctly, Paul's talking about a, a 
training weights that they used and in, in, that athletes used. I hear about things like this. I don't really know from personal experience. Uh, they, I've seen people run with carrying weights to, to train themselves, or I, I, I know a little more about baseball, and I think about the, the batter has those, those ring-shaped things they put on the bat when they're warming up. But when it's time to go to bat, you take those things off, right? <laughs> you don't go to bat with those things on there. You want that bat to be quick then. When the runner is getting ready to run the actual race, they're not going to carry any weights with them. You know? <laughs> That's, the time for that is past. They need to be, they need to be quick and ready. David, Sir. You the term, <laughs> I may not be using it correctly either. Mm-hmm. That was in a different fashion. Mm-hmm. This is an example, I think, of one that's so clear. Yeah. We let the cares of the world, whether they're a sin in and of themselves or not, anything that is competing for our attention away from God, we need to deny it space within our hearts and so mm-hmm. this I think is a succinct example of one. Mm-hmm. Keeping that distance is a good point. Good point. Reminds me for some reason of my uh, living in, in Denton, kind of out on the edge of town. I heard my cat outside making a strange growling noise like I'd never heard him make before, and I went outside to see what he was doing. There was a snapping turtle that big walking through the yard, and the cat was growling and hissing at it from a distance of about from where I am to that table. <laughs> He wasn't going to get anywhere close to it. He was going to, he was going to watch it, but he, he wasn't going to get any place close to it. He was going to keep a good distance. He didn't, didn't have any desire to see how close he could get without getting caught. And we need to be that way with sin. Then there's the good soil. It bears fruit with patience in, uh, in, Luke's, in Luke's recounting of this parable, or Jesus' explanation. bears fruit with patience. Doesn't all come at once, does it? Speaking of the, the garden, as a kid, I remember, you can, I'm sure you can predict this, as soon as we planted things that day, the next day I'd get up, go out there and see if anything come up yet. <laughs> well, of course it hadn't. Go out the next day, see if anything came up yet. You've probably had similar kinds of experiences as kids, and then finally you go out one morning and you see a little something, see a little bit of green there and realize, okay, it is actually going to happen. Dad was right. It is going to come up. It produces what its capability allows. Uh, some are 60, and some are 30, some are 60, some are 100. So the good soil, it's described as good soil. It's not all going to produce equally for Jesus doesn't really say why. We just need to remember that, and that's, that's okay. In the parable of the talents, there's the man with there's the man with five, there's the man with two. Am I getting the numbers right? Math, always my downfall. And the man who goes, the man who has more, has the most talents, goes and invests, and he gets back more than the next man does who has fewer talents to invest. What does the, what does the master say to both of them? Well done, good and faithful servant. You did, what, you did the best you could with what you had. And that's, that's, that's kind of, I think, what we see in this parable. Some is going to have more success than others, and you may not have any, you may never know why. But the yield is pretty great. I mean, a 30-fold yield compared to the amount of seed that you put out, that's pretty good farming. A hundredfold is incredible. So it's still going to be good. Well... Hmm. 
It's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I, I don't know. I have to think about that. It's interesting. After the fact, yeah. he was never saved. Yeah. Great joy and then fell away. Yeah, that's true. And so uh, this is a good one of many verses that. Mm -hmm. It's true. To, 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 when you said that, I kind of thought of a, the anti part of how Paul is. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a diff different, kind of different topic, an interesting one. I'll have to think more about that. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, the laborers in the vineyard, different times. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be seems to be a, a pretty close comparison there. he was talking about there, and I think that'll be my excuse, okay. is that he was talking about a different parable and fruit could mean a different thing in one parable to another. I have to look at that more closely. I'm sorry, I have to, no, have to I think about to that. Right. So I'm asking you that, that's the second bell. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I fully agreed with what Jason taught in his sermon about the vine and the branches. I think perhaps Jesus used fruit in different contexts, in different contexts there, in these two parables could be using it in different contexts. That there, can, there are the fruits of the Spirit. There is also Paul very obviously using, in, in 1 Corinthians, very obviously using uh, the planting the grain. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase, referring to people who he's in the context of, uh, well, the, the people in Corinth having, you know, divisions over who baptized them and who, so it's over the, it's in the context of uh, souls being saved and Paul is just saying, I planted and he watered. So there's that same uh, idea of the plant growing and bearing fruit, but used to talk about, about conversions. But Jesus could use, it's also used talking about the fruits of the Spirit. So you have the fruit is being used in different ways in some different parables, I think. It's not necessarily one thing in each one of those examples. Thank you all very much.